Well, I want to um, start the message today by telling you that this is the message. As, um, as I was preparing the series and, and going through the love letters as we've been talking about and been looking at the letters to the seven churches, this was the one that I knew when it got to it was going to get me the most. Um, I'd, I'd been preparing this one, been thinking about this one, been working on this one um, from day one. This is the church of my greatest fear. I'm just being real with you. If, in fact, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to get any kind of sympathy or anything. This, this message is so meaningful to me that when the first service ended, I just feel completely defeated because it's so, it's so near and dear to my heart. This is such an important message. I feel to, to, to me and to, to everyone I could communicate it with. And, and to be honest with you, I don't think I can preach this message in a way possibly that I will leave this pulpit and I will feel like I did an adequate job. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than what I can say. People ask me uh, often, I, I get this question a lot. I, I get to talk with a lot of pastors. I, I work with some church planners in an organization um, try to help them. Again, essentially, I, I, I wouldn't call what I did here a church plant, but we, we, we operated it as a church plant. And I planted two churches in the past, and church planting is very difficult. So I, I try to talk with a lot of pastors and leaders that are going through the church planting process. And um, there's an organization out of Virginia that I work with and kind of help coach and teach some to some pastors one of the questions I get very often, I, I get people that ask me that are pastors, they say, John, what is your greatest fear? And without hesitation from day one, this answer has never changed. I've, I've never altered this answer. Um, from the, for, for as long as I can remember reading these letters, today is my greatest fear. It's the church at Sardis. So I wanna, I wanna read you, I, I, wanna, I wanna take you into this and and we're gonna see, again, what the Lord can do with this. I, I do ask for your prayers because, again, I, I don't think I can communicate this. There's no way for me to do it and leave this pulpit and think that I did a good job. It's just not gonna happen because this is such an important message to me. And, and, and I want you to just now open your hearts and your minds, and I really want you to listen to the Lord, not me. I want you to listen to the Lord, what he's doing what he's leading right now. Let's dive into this in Revelation chapter three, verse one. This is the fifth letter that we've looked at in Revelation. You can go back and listen to the other four. It says, to the angel of the church at Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. Here it is. You have a reputation of being alive but you're dead. You have a reputation being alive, vibrant, authentic, real, but you're dead. He says in verse two, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have found your deeds unfinished in my sight. Remember, therefore, that you have received what, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, look at your neighbor, say, wake up. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm gonna do my very, very, very best to keep my composure, to keep it together because again, this literally makes me sick. It does. I, I, in fact, I've said, I'm, I'm telling you things I don't even say in the first service. Uh, 
I've said this before in case you've never heard me say it. Every Sunday that I get here, people don't realize this. I'm sick as a dog every Sunday. I'm, I'm sick to my stomach. I feel like I'm going to vomit. And uh, many, many years ago, I prayed. I said, God, would you please just deliver me of this? The enemy's after me. And um, there was a day that the Lord spoke to me. He said, John, he said, I'm allowing that to happen to you because he said, I need you to know that you need me. He said, I, he said, I don't ever want you to get, get up in that pulpit and feel comfortable. I don't ever want you to get up in that pulpit and feel like you got it. He said, you better always get up into that pulpit with an understanding of the weight that you carry as, as, as giving the word of the Lord. And, and as I woke up this morning, I woke up even a tad early of what I normally do. I couldn't sleep because I know, I, I know that this one makes me sick. Man, it, it scares me. I, I, I worry about this every day. I come over here every Sunday morning. I come over here. I come in here through the week. I, I walk through this place early in the morning. I pray over these chairs. I sit in this pulpit. I pray over this pulpit and this stage. And one of the prayers I pray is I say, God, don't let us be Sardis. Don't let us be the one that has a reputation. Listen, as you, many of you, again, aren't from our church. We had a reputation for a long time, and the reputation we carry now is not the reputation that we always had. <laughs> in case you guys didn't know it, we had people in our church that thought we sacrificed, and we had people in our community that thought we sacrificed chickens here, for real. That's, that's the kind of reputation we had. Um, and so we, we were the wild church. We were the crazy church. I'm going to tell you something about this church. We were the trailblazers. And I don't say that because I did it. I was a kid. I wasn't even born for some of these years. These were the leaders that, that blazed a trail in our community for the kingdom of God, preaching messages that this city had never heard, doing worship that this city had never heard, having experiences at the altar that this city had never seen. We were the trailblazers. We had a reputation. And today I look and I sit and I stand in amazement now that we get to, to, to have this reputation. That this week, I get a call this week that, hey, there's a, there's a lunch luncheon that's happening in Augusta with all the Congress, I mean, with, with all the, the uh, Georgia House of Representatives and all the Georgia senators and all these leaders. We want you there to meet and greet, to interact with these people. We hear the Lord's doing great things in your church. The Lord's doing great things in your city through you. Wow, what a great thing, right, to have the reputation that this is the place that's happening. This is the place that's got it going on. But God forbid we have a reputation and it not be real. God forbid Sardis is a city that, it's, it's an incredible city. That's the way the, the historians would write about it. They would talk about how incredible the city was. It was very wealthy. I'll tell you, it's a different kind of wealth. Let me only tell you how wealthy this city was. This, wealthy was so, this city was so wealthy, they invented money. Come on, somebody. That's a different kind of wealth right there. Amen. <laughs> they were the city that is given the credit for inventing money. They had the wealth. They were sitting up on a hilltop above a valley 1,500 feet in the air. They had a very safe city. In fact, it was a city that if you go back and you read about their leaders, their leaders never believed that anyone would be able to come in and to take their city over. They would never lose a battle because of where they sat on top of this hill. It was the perfect high ground, and they thought they would never be taken until a day when Cyrus came in and he took it over because there was a secret passageway up a, a staircase, and a, a soldier dropped his helmet, and they found the secret secret passageway up these stairs, and they took the city of Sardis. It looked like on the outside that this place had everything that was going on. They had it going on. But as Jesus writes about it, he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. As I hear Jesus say these words, I don't know if anybody else automatically thinks of this. Again, I tell you, God speaks to me strangely through movies. But whenever I read this, my mind immediately goes to Weekend at Bernie's. Come on, somebody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any Weekend at Bernie's fans in the house? Bernie, our boy that he wasn't alive, but he sure did act like he was alive while they were trying to act like he was alive. Bernie was at the party. Bernie was at the beach, Bernie was riding the golf cart, Bernie was riding the boat, was even drugged behind the boat. And I, I think about Bernie, and I'll say, man, is that a picture of the church? It looks like everything could be going on, is going on around it. 
but there's no real life there. The, 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 the church at Sardis is described two, two ways. He says, you are dead. And then he says, no life. And in the Greek language, if you go back and you kind of study the way that this was written, it is almost, uh, almost written exactly the way that Jesus, if you go back to Matthew 23, if you remember Matthew, Jesus is, is, is confronting the Pharisees the religious people of his time. And he makes this statement to them in Matthew 23, 27. He says, well, you look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. So Jesus says it in Matthew. He says it again here in Revelation that you have that of, an ador- of, of a corpse that has been beautifully adorned. In fact, it's funny to me, I, I do a lot of funerals and I don't know that I'll ever get over this statement. How many of you guys have ever been to a funeral and some of you have probably said this and I'm not making fun of you, but when you really sit back and think about it, it is kind of funny. You go to the funeral home and you go see the family, you go see the person and there the body is laying there. What do they look at you and say? Man, don't they look good? Uh, Sure. Yeah, they look great, right? And that what they always want to say? They always want to say, man, don't they look good? How many, how many churches are there, man? How many people do we have in the church right now that are lying there as lifeless bodies, but they have adorned themselves? They've done the hair, they've done the makeup, they've put the clothes on, they've put the jewelry on, and then you want to go, but don't they look good? This idea of reputation, I have no doubt in this room right now that we have people of reputation, I've no doubt that there are people in this room that, that understand this idea of, yeah, everybody looks at my marriage and they think, we, they think we have it all together. And if they only realized that behind the scenes, man, we're crumbling, we're falling apart because it's just a reputation. People in this room right now that, that you look on the outside and you go, man, look at, they got, they got everything they want. Look, they got a brand new car. They got all the money they could want. They got the house. And people don't realize that if you really look at it, man, they're in a financial mess. It's just a reputation. It's just, it's just something they're putting on the outside to give a look. Some of you that are in this room right now, you walk around in life, man, you put on a smile, you try to act like you're happy, you got it together, and everybody's looking at your life going, man, I wish I could be happy like so-and-so. I wish I could put a smile on my face like so-and-so. And man, the reality is, is on the inside, man, you're crushed. You're, you're, you're not, there's no joy, there's no peace. Because it's, it's, it's just like putting makeup on a corpse. And that's what he tells us here about this church. And what does he tell us to do? He says, wake up! Wake up! When I read that, I, I, I don't always like name my messages but as I was thinking this, this week and I was going through these notes and I'm rewriting and writing and rewriting and writing, I probably wrote this message, I probably wrote this message 20 times over the last month and a half. The Lord just kept dealing with me, kept dealing with me and I wanted to go, man, this is so near and dear to my heart. I want this to be right. I, I want people to, to feel what I feel. I want people to hear from the Lord what I feel like I'm hearing from the Lord. Um, and then I had this thing come up in my mind so you could call this the title if you want to. Uh, Are you woke? Come on, somebody. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. It is no coincidence that the cultural word of the day is woke while the church is asleep. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that that's what's called, that's what culture is telling you that you need to be. You need to be woke. Listen, let me tell you something. There's a right woke and the wrong woke and what the world is trying to feed you right now is the wrong woke. I'm just being as real as I can be with you. It's the wrong woke. When you have weeks like we're in right now and Please hear my heart. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I don't get political, but, but I, I'm just gonna be as real as I can be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straightforward as I can be with you. When you have things happening like we have happening right now, we're at Harvard University. You've got the queer group, and I'm not calling them that. That's their name, the queer group, protesting against Israel. 
When you have that happening on a university campus with educated people and they don't see the reality that as homosexuals, if they go to Palestine, Hamas would literally execute them for their lifestyle, but yet they call that woke? Let me tell you something. That's not the right woke. When, when, when you have organizations like Black Lives Matter, which if anybody knows me, you know that I am not anti-race in any way, shape, or form. I love every color brother and sister I have in my life. But when you have Black Lives Matter telling you that Black Lives Matter and you need to protest when these things happen, and yet over in the Middle East right now, we have white, brown, and black brothers and sisters being executed right now, and they are silent, and they say nothing, but yet they say, I'm not woke because I won't protest with them. I'm gonna tell you something. There's an issue there. The enemy has taken the word that God desires for his people and he's trying to take it and use it. He's trying to pull one over on you right now and to tell you that this is what woke looks like. Let me tell you, there's only one place I need to know that I need to go to see what it looks like to be awake and it's right here in the word of God. Amen. This has everything that I need to know what it is to be woke. I don't need anything in culture that they are trying to feed me right now. If it is against the word of God, it puts me to sleep. Amen. In fact, I would say that these people that claim to be woke in our culture right now, that what they really are is they are asleep and they're dreaming. They're living some alternate reality of what woke is supposed to be. When we live in a day and age where you can't say that I'm awake because I say that there are two sexes, that there are man and woman, and that for some reason makes people say that I'm not woke, you're in a dream, okay? I'm not trying to be political. I'm not trying to just get things stirred up, and I'm not trying to even... I'm not trying to hit points that just make people that are on one side or the other go, yeah, that's right, amen. That's not what I'm trying to do. I want you to see what the enemy's up to right now. It is time for people to be woke, but it's not that woke. We gotta look at what the New Testament teaches us. Let's look at what the Bible teaches us. In fact, the Bible tells us a lot about waking up. If, if, if you look at scripture, one that comes right to mind is Matthew 25, um, and it compares great with what we just read out of Revelation 3, Matthew 25. We see the parable of the ten virgins there at the beginning of that, of that chapter. And what was the parable of the ten virgins? That, yeah, that the bridegroom was going to come and the, 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 the bride was waiting on the bridegroom to return. And that while the bridegroom was out and the bride was waiting to return, what happened to the ten virgins? They fell asleep. And they didn't know the day or the hour that this was going to return, that this was going to impact their life. And it talks about there were five wise and five unwise. Five took oil, five didn't take oil. But the whole point of the thing was, is it was time to wake up. We go back to the, to again, the stories in the Bible. What about a guy named Samson? Anybody remember a guy named Samson? Samson, here's a guy that, when was he attacked? While he was sleeping. It's when they came after him. Every time, while he was sleeping. David has to go slay Goliath. When did David go slay Goliath? The Bible specifically tells us he woke up early in the morning to let us know, listen, if you, if you don't wake up, you can't slay giants. It's not gonna happen. We go through all of these passages in the Bible of things like Jesus telling his disciples to keep watch for me. As I go into the garden to pray, I want you to be a part of what is about to happen. How amazing is it to know that the God of the universe is about to fulfill the plan of redemption and God invites humanity to step into that moment with him to see the gospel fulfilled through the person of Jesus Christ. And while Jesus is in praying, and we don't know how long he was in there, but we do have a, a record of what he said and it didn't take very long that when he turned around and came back to those that were supposed to to be with him in this plan of redemption, he came back to a sleeping church. 
They were asleep. And Jesus had to wake them up. And then he went back again and prayed again. And he came back out. And where were they? They were asleep again. We see that prophets like Ezekiel and Isaiah talk about the watchman. The watchman that were going to stand watch. But fell asleep. We see passages in the Bible like Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And to this, understanding the present time, understanding the present time. Do you understand the time that you're living in? The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. The hour has already come. We're not waiting on an alarm clock, guys. It's time to wake up. It's time right now. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's a, that, that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Uh, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 5, you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then let us not be like others who are asleep. Sleep, but let us wake up and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 13 Do not love sleep, or you will grow poor. Stay awake, and you will have food to spare. Isaiah 51 17 says, Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem. That's us. That's who, that, that is referencing not just Israel. But the New Testament church that has been grafted in, it is time to wake up. Psalm 57 verse 8 says, awake my soul. Listen to this. This is my favorite one. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. That the Bible says that the ability for the dawn to come up rests on you and me to wake up. That there is a light that is inherently in my life that will dispel darkness, but if I stay asleep, the dawn will not rise. It is my job to arise, to let these things come to pass. Let me give you three things real quick. This is gonna be on a list, and then I got three more things, and then I'm gonna tell you a story out of the Bible. Let me give you these three things real quick that you need to know about while, you're, while you are sleeping. If you're here and you are asleep, you need to know this. Number one, while you are sleeping, you are vulnerable. Come on, somebody. Anybody ever have a sleepover growing up? Come on. The only thing that you didn't want to be was the first one to sleep. Amen? Because that put you in a vulnerable position, right? Am I telling the truth? I'm vulnerable. and, And here's the crazy part about it. When I'm asleep, not only am I vulnerable, but I'm actually losing ground. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm actually losing ground. I've told this story before. If you've heard it, just laugh again because it's hilarious. If you've never heard it, you're going to love this one. I, when I was in Gainesville, I uh, did uh, a lot of funerals, a lot, a lot of funerals. I was the chaplain for the big funeral home there, and anybody that didn't have a pastor, they called me to come do their funeral, and I would have to go do past, uh, funerals for people that I didn't know all the time. So I never really knew what I was going to walk into. Well, there was this one day, the, the funeral director there, his name was Kevin, not Kevin Beggs, another Kevin. Um, but Kevin uh, and me were really close. We were really tight. He was the nephew of the owner of the funeral home, and uh, we spent a lot of time together. We would watch Braves games, and he would do stuff for my family and stuff. He was a great guy. Well, uh, Kevin and I would always get together and try to figure out what the funeral was going to be like if I didn't know the family. Well, we we had this funeral this one time, and uh, it was a man, uh, and Kevin said, I really can't tell you a whole lot about what to expect today. He says, I really haven't had a real good conversation with the family. The funeral was paid for. They said they've paid for everything, uh, but they want to do a funeral here at such and such time, such and such a day. So if you'll come do it, I really don't know what to tell you to expect um, so I get there and I go to do the funeral and, I, and I, I'm in the, I'm the, there's a chapel at the funeral home. I'm in the chapel and there's no one at the funeral. It's just me and the dead person. And that's a strange way to do a funeral. Amen? Come on, somebody. That is a strange, if you've never done that before, that is a strange way to do a funeral. So I yell back to Kevin. I, I'm in there by myself. It's time to start the funeral. I say, Kevin, there's nobody here. Will you just pay me and let me leave? And he was like, no, 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 go ahead and do the funeral. I said, Kevin, he can't hear me. He said, but we're going to record it. That way, if the family wants the recording, then we'll send them the recording. I said, okay, that's fine. 
so my crazy self is standing up in the middle of a funeral chapel doing a funeral with just me and a dead body. Now that is a strange way. I've been in some churches that feel that way, but that is the first time I've literally done it. I'm preaching this funeral and in the middle of a funeral, a woman walks in. I say, thank you, Jesus. And this woman walks in and she walks right up to the casket. In the middle of the funeral, I'm just up there talking. And so I'm like, I don't really know what to do, so I'm just gonna keep going. I'm like, look at this, this is so sweet. They wanna come right up and, and you know, go right in the casket and everything. And I watch her look, lean over in the casket. And I just keep doing the funeral. And next thing you know, I look down and this chick takes off all the guy's jewelry. She takes his rings off, his bracelet off. And I mean, I'm like, so I didn't know what to do. I ain't never seen nobody rob a dead person. And so I don't know, what, what, what do you do here? I, I didn't know. And so the woman, after she's done, I said, well, maybe she's just holding on to stuff. And so she turns around to walk over. The chick walked out the chapel. She left the chapel. And I yelled, Kevin, we were robbed. <laughs> like, that's what I said in the middle of it. I said, I didn't know what to say because I didn't want to be in trouble. And, and so come to find out, it was a loved one um, that was there. And so that, but I was like, man, what a great picture of us when we sleep of the vulnerable place that we find ourselves, where the enemy can come in and take from us and rob us and defeat us in our posture of sleep. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse, 20, verse 33, it says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Just a small moment of rest, he says, the enemy will come in and rob you. Gotta guard it. Number two, the second thing, while you sleep, you are powerless. Not only are you vulnerable, but you're powerless. It doesn't matter how much potential or power there, are, there is. You, you can't express it. You can't show it because you're asleep. Samson, again, is the perfect example of this. Is Samson, again, the, the strongest man that's ever lived that we, could, that we know of. This, this, this man of great strength was absolutely powerless in his time of sleep. And here's what I know to be true. Tell me if I'm wrong, guys. What I know to be true is that the world is looking for a powerful church. Because let me tell you something. If the church were the real church that Jesus said that we were supposed to be, we wouldn't be able to keep people out of this place. Because they'd be drawn. We are drawn to power. If you don't believe me, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of this. I gave this example in the first service. Um, how many of you guys ever heard of rainbow vacuum cleaners? Come on, somebody. Raise your hand. Now, my grandmother, who's not in the second service today, but she was in the first service, is the cheapest woman that's ever lived, ever in the history of the world. They don't come any more frugal than her. They don't come any cheaper than her. My grandmother, throughout the years of my life, has bought like three rainbow vacuum cleaners. Them things are like $18,000. <laughs> you have to pay for them things for the rest of your life and your children's children's children will still be having to host parties trying to get a free rainbow vacuum cleaner if you can have people come over and they commit to buy 10. Come on. Some of y'all in the room right now, y'all still trying to sell them things and I rebuke that spirit right now in Jesus' name. Don't you come at me saying, hey, I need to have a party. We need to have a small group at my house. We're gonna show this rainbow vacuum cleaner. Because what do they do? They come in with this vacuum cleaner and they look at you and this is what they say. I've been to one. I don't know if you've ever been to one. They'll say, your house looks so clean. But you are a filthy animal. And you don't even know it. And they come in there and they take that rainbow vacuum cleaner and they, they go over your floor and they pull that top off of that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They pull that top off of that rainbow vacuum. Now y'all been vacuuming. Come on, somebody. You vacuumed for the rainbow vacuum cleaner got there, didn't you? You vacuumed that house 10 times that day because you knew that they was gonna find junk in your carpet and you was gonna do your best. I used to tell my grandma, she'd buy them rainbow vacuum cleaners. I'd say, have you lost your mind? You could buy me a car. You can go to Bill's Dollar Store and buy a Dirt Devil for $39.99. But you over here spending $18,000 on a rainbow vacuum cleaner because they take that top off and this is what they show you something that looks like it's out of a Stephen King book and they say, look in here and you look in and they say, you are disgusting. 
Look at the filth you're living in. Look at the power of this vacuum cleaner. And every one of y'all, as soon as you look in that thing and you see all that junk, you go, I got to have one of these. I got to spend $18,000 on this vacuum cleaner because I can't live in this kind of mess because we're drawn to power. One of the reasons the world is not drawn to the church of Jesus Christ is because we're Sardis. We have a reputation of being alive, but we're dead. We're powerless because we're asleep. We're not powerless because we don't have potential to carry power. Can I tell y'all something? This hit me after the first service, and maybe this one thing will make me feel better about the way I'm preaching today because I, I, I thought about this after the fact. I had somebody come up to me, and they're a new believer in our church, and they wanted to pray about something, and they wanted to pray for healing for a family member, and I prayed with them, and this is what I told them, and I should have said this in the message in the first service. If you are here, listen to me, if you are here and you are the babiest of Christian that we have in the room, if you are the newest to faith, if you are the most immature Christian that could possibly be because you just gave your life to Jesus, you just started this journey, can I tell you that even the babies in Christianity still have more power than the devil? Come on, think about that with me for a minute. The most immature of you, you, have, you still have more authority than the devil will ever have. Because it is on the inside of you. But if I sleep, that power is meaningless. Number three, a sleeping, vulnerable, powerless church is not God's plan. So while you sleep, you're vulnerable. While you're vulnerable, you're powerless. And let me tell you something. That is not the plan of God for his people. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with with such people. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. You know what that's called? It's called being asleep. It's not God's plan. I I, I don't have time. I I really have to move on. I really, really, really have to move on. Let me give you three things that call sleep. Um, Number one is isolation. And this isn't me. I, I did a lot of study on sleeping Studies. I, I, I did a lot of look into this. And, and, and did you know that, that people who, who test sleeping, do you know that isolation is something that makes us sleepy? And anybody, again, that you ever had a, a sleepover, you know that's true. Why? Because you didn't want to miss anything, right? You want to stay awake all night when all your friends were over there. But when you're by yourself, you just kind of doze off to sleep. But here's the other reason I thought about why that matters for us as the church of Jesus Christ. If I'm isolated, I have no one there to shake me, to wake me up and hold me accountable for falling asleep. And I need that. I need people to look and say, John, no, 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 you don't need to fall asleep right now. Number two, diet and dehydration. Did you know that diet and dehydration affect your ability to sleep? I remember I've got two cousins. I don't remember if Coach Campbell did this when I was here. Uh, If he did, I didn't listen to him, I guess. Uh, but, but, but when my cousins, uh, I've got two cousins that played in Duncan, South Carolina, a high school called Burns High School. Um, and they played from 06 to like 2011 between the two of them or something like that. But they, um, they, they, they were the number one high school football team in America for four years straight. Um, I mean, I'm talking, they were the best team. I mean, everybody that wanted to play them, they were just, just all over the country. And I'll never forget that when they were playing for Burns, we would get to Thanksgiving and we would all get ready to eat. And their coaches at Burns High School would not allow them to eat turkey the weekend of Thanksgiving because they had to play that weekend and turkey is something that makes you sleepy. So I didn't know that. It all makes sense now. <laughs> right? But what I consume, listen to me, what you consume will feed you being sleepy. Sleepy. So you gotta watch what you consume. And I'm not talking about physical food, I'm talking about in your body. I'm talking about in your mind, in your spirit. Be careful what you consume. Number three, exhaustion. Obviously exhaustion makes people go to sleep. Some of you right now, you're sleeping and it's not because you don't love Jesus, it's because you've served so hard for so long, it has put you to sleep. 
In fact, I would tell my brother right here, as I've been able to, you guys were able to be blessed by the ministry of Mr. Aaron Childs just a couple weeks ago, and through conversation and lunch with him, he basically told me this exact thing. It wasn't that he didn't love the Lord. It wasn't that he wasn't earnestly seeking the Lord. It just got to the point where he had been serving the Lord so hard for so long that he allowed that to put him to sleep. And he wasn't fully aware of what was really happening in his life. I'm telling you, it's real. I've experienced it. So some of you right now, you're asleep just because you're exhausted. So let's look now at a story. I wanna tell you a story real quick. I'm so far behind. I wanna take you into a story that we looked at a few weeks ago. And it's the story of Peter in Acts 12 where he's put in prison. We just looked at this. I was really wanting to go a different direction, but, but I really could not escape this. Peter's put in prison in Acts 12. We're gonna read this story. Peter, in case you don't realize it, is a representative of the church in scripture. When you read Peter, you're not just reading about Peter, you're reading about the church. Jesus gives Peter the word for the church when they're at Caesarea and Philippi, and he says, it's upon this rock that I will build my church, all this. We see it's Peter that stands up on the day of Pentecost on the church's birthday and delivers that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. So when we read about Peter, we're really reading about the church. So I wanna look at this story real quick in Acts chapter 12, verse one. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with, was met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to, to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Verse six, I'm gonna take this in a direction that I've never preached this story before. I'm gonna show you some things that I've never even considered. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial. So the night before he was supposed to be executed, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Pay attention to that. Bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison and he had no idea, listen to this, he had no idea what the angel was doing. If it was really happening, he thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. And they had walked the length of one street. Suddenly the angel left them. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping what happened? I've got to go through this. Listen, check this out. Herod is after Peter. He wants to kill him. He puts him in prison and he gets ready to execute him. Now, here's what's interesting. Peter is all by himself. What did I tell you leads to being sleepy? Isolation. He's all by himself. The church is together and they're praying for Peter. But Peter is not with the church. The question becomes, if you are isolated right now, what do you see? What do you recognize right now as you're isolated? How are you operating right now in your moment of isolation? Because what we know about Peter is this. You put Peter in a crowd, he'll cut off a ear. Put Peter in a crowd, he'll preach a sermon. Put Peter in a crowd, he'll look down to a man at a gate called Beautiful and say, rise and walk. But isolate him. And he's asleep. He's sleeping. 
how in the world do you sleep the night before you're supposed to be executed? There's no way I could go to sleep. Maybe he was asleep because again, as I said, not only is he isolated, but he's worked so hard for the Lord, he's exhausted. So now he's isolated, he's been working for the Lord. He's tired. I don't know how many of you right now, no, you don't have to show me your hand, this is rhetorical, but how many of you in the room, honestly, you would say to me, man, I'm so tired. I'm tired of surviving. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of standing. I'm tired of carrying the weight. I'm just tired. Peter is tired and he is alone. Now listen to me, check this out. The only company Peter has while he's sleeping. The only company Peter has while he is sleeping are the company of those that have been given the assignment to keep him isolated and to hold him there until his day of execution. Peter is chained to two soldiers whose sole assignment is to hold him where he is. Let me tell you something. That is something that the enemy is doing right now in this place. There are some of you that you are in the presence of spirits whose sole assignment are to keep you right where you are until you are executed. That the enemy wants to put you to sleep. Byron, would you come up here with me for a minute? Would you help me? Let me tell you what the enemy's doing, Byron, right now. The enemy's saying, hey, come here, buddy. Come here, come here, come here. Come, here. come on. Oh, you don't want to get in it like that. They was trying to mess you up, wasn't they? Come here, come here, get in this bed. Come here, come here, come here. Come on, get in this bed. Come here, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. let me put you a pillow. Here you go, come on. Come on, there you go, there you go. Come on, come on, come on. How's that feel? How's that feel? Does that feel good? I've been preaching a long time. I know you're tired. Right, nice and comfortable. Come on, hey, you want another blanket? Here you go. Come on, just in case. This is what the enemy's doing to us right now, guys. Listen, this is what he's doing. He's saying, I want to I wanna get you to stay right here. I want to get you to stay right here, buddy. You, you relax. You get nice and comfortable because as long as I can get you asleep and I can keep you where you are, I can keep you here until it's time for your execution. I want to make sure that I keep you here. Oh, you might need something else. Hold on. I got some squish mellows right here that in case... <laughs> In case you need something else. Here, look, hold on to this right now. Man, that'll make it feel real good. Here's your another one. There you go. Yeah, you hold on to that right now. Doesn't that feel good? Man, don't you feel good? How many of you guys ever put your kids to bed, right? You, you sit on the edge of the bed. Hey, come on, buddy. It's all right. Come on. Shh. My wife does this to my kids. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to sleep, Arabella. You are sleepy. Yes, you are. So go to sleep and dream. Did you write that? Is that a real lullaby? Okay. Yeah, she's laughing because that is really what she does to our children. She, she sings to them. Come on. That's what the enemy's doing. The enemy's he's singing you that lullaby. He's, he's, he's tucking you in to that bed. He's giving you the squish mellows to hold on to. He's, I'm going to give you this to hold on to. You just stay asleep because as long as I can keep you asleep, you will sleep in something that God intends to break you out of. Come on, somebody. God already said, he said, I already got a way to get you out of this thing. He said, but I'm going to make sure that you sleep in something that God's wanting to bring you out of. I probably ought to preach this whole sermon again next week because I don't know if y'all are like me. My mom and dad had to call my name more than once to wake me up. So I probably ought to do this again to make sure that you get it. Let me give you three things as we close. Dad, come on up. I'm going to do these real fast. Number one, write this down. The supernatural is not asleep even when you are asleep. But your situation is not going to change until you wake up. Can I tell everybody in the room something? Just because you're asleep does not mean that the things of God are asleep in your life. And one of the cool part of the stories is, is that while Peter is sleeping, the angel is active. Are you hearing me, church? While you sleep, the angel is active. Let me tell you something about the angels of God in your life. The angels are not afraid of your dark. The angels will step right into my night to wake me up. That's what the Bible says happened to Peter. Peter was asleep, but the angel shows up. He shows up in that moment. 
And he tells Peter, he says, wake up. Let me tell you something the devil wants you to do, and he's doing it more right now than we've ever seen before. But there is a remnant. I'm telling you, church, there is a remnant who is proving this to be. This, this gets, the enemy wants people to be asleep to the supernatural. The, the enemy wants people to be asleep to the things of the kingdom of God. The enemy doesn't want you to understand that there are angels right now in your life. He doesn't want you to realize that there are demons right now that are coming against you right now. I just had a great conversation with someone in this room just, I think it was last Sunday. She said, man, I've been asking preachers for years. What about these passages about spirits? What about this one that says that I'm supposed to go raise the dead, heal the sick, heal, uh, uh, raise the dead, heal the sick, heal, uh, uh, heal those with leprosy? What about these passages and she said everywhere that I go all they tell me is I don't know I don't know yeah we do know the word of God tells us that the spiritual places are very real and just because you are unaware of the spiritual places does not mean that those spiritual places do not exist the fact that Peter was asleep and the angel shows up at Peter's bedside can I tell you what it proves it shows me that I thought I was waiting on God, but God is really waiting on me. I thought I was waiting on God to show up, and really the angel's standing there the whole time saying, wake up. Wake up. Number two, write this down. Fully awake does not always mean fully aware. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what it is to wake up and not be fully awake because you're not fully aware? You don't really know what's going on. Anybody wake up and go, what's going on? What's going on, huh? What happened? What happened? <laughs> sleepwalking is one thing. There are people in the church right now that are sleepwalking. We had a girl in our youth group one time that she worked for the hospital in Gainesville. She slept while she woke up. She got dressed, went, got in her car, drove all the way to the hospital and clocked in and then drove back home and went back in the bed and she slept walked the whole time. Isn't that scary? I think people are doing that? Isn't that insane? But then I have this other story where it's this idea of being f not fully aware. I have this friend that was camping down at the lake one time and he left his campsite. He was gonna go to the Golden Pantry to get gas and I was at the Golden Pantry when he pulled up and he got out of the truck and uh, I saw him over and I was like, hey man, what's going on? And I looked over, he didn't put any pants on. Now, he had on underwear, but he didn't have any pants on. And I said, bro, I said, you ain't got no pants on. You're in your drawers. And he looked back at me, he said, oh, man, he didn't even have any idea. <laughs> you know, what I've learned is about my relationship with God, so, so what I've learned is, is that just because I'm awake doesn't mean I'm fully aware of what God's doing. Because the Bible says that while Peter and God were in operation together, the Bible says Peter didn't know what God was doing. He couldn't understand it. People ask me all the time, they say, John, how did you get where you are? And can I be completely real with you? I mean, completely real. I have no idea. All I know is that God dealt with me and I tried to follow him. And so many of the times I didn't understand it. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to wrap my, my mind around it. But as the angel told Peter to do, he said, listen, I know you don't fully understand what's going on, but follow me. I followed and I ended up here. And I'm gonna tell you something. Listen, that's why you better be very careful what you're following. Because you're not always fully aware. And if I follow what the Lord is telling me, even when I don't understand it, gates will open. And as the Bible says, it just opens. When my eyes open, gates open. Come on, somebody, say it with me. When my eyes open, gates open. Come on. When I wake up, I don't even have to fully understand it. Chains will fall off of my life. Gates will begin to open up to me. And then the moment will come like it did in this story. Herod came back to where Peter was, and he expected to find Peter still there, and Peter was not there. Do not let the enemy hold you right here asleep so that when he returns, you are right where he left you. Wake up. You got to move from this place. Number three, the last thing. 
You go to sleep in stages, and you also wake up in stages. I love this point. Because the Bible says that that Peter didn't just wake up all at once, but it happened in stages. My wife and I, we carpooled together for like four years, uh, seven 15, 7 o'clock in the morning, riding to work together. I'm going to tell you something. That is a place for spiritual warfare in Jesus' name. And so in, in four years of riding together, neither of us are morning people at all. And in four years of riding together, we probably said four words to each other. Why? Because we got to wake up in stages. All right, give, give me a stage and I'll give you another stage, right? How many of you guys are morning people? Raise your hand. Yep, I don't like you. Um, y'all are happy in the morning calling me. And in fact, all of y'all that are morning people, y'all are the ones that call me every morning and go, it's 7.30 in the morning, 7.15 in the morning. I answer the phone because I am up. I am up. I've already got my kids to school. Y'all call me. You say, oh, did I get you out of bed? No, I just sound like this. <laughs> every day before 10 o'clock. I'm not still in bed. This is called my morning voice. I don't wake up going, hi, how are you? That's not what I do. It happens in stages. Don't call me at 6 o'clock in the morning and say, man, you sound sick. Yeah, I'm sleepy. So the angel comes to Peter. What happens first? He says, wake up. And his eyes pop open. Stage one, wake up, eyes open. See, some of you right now, you need to have your salvation awakened. That's it, that's stage one. My eyes open, salvation is there before me. I didn't know how I was gonna get out, now I know how I'm gonna get out. I didn't know how I was gonna, I didn't know how I was gonna escape this, now I know how I'm gonna escape this. There is salvation there before me. And then he says this, He says, all right, quick, get up. There you go. Let's put down the squishmallows. I know they're comfortable. (laughs) Come on, get all the way up, brother. Come on, he says he pushes him on his side. Says, come on, man, get up. Come on, let me help you up. There you go, let me help you. And all right, the next thing, the next stage to waking up is what? Faith. I'm gonna put some action with what my eyes have opened to. He says, I'm gonna wake him up. And then he says this. He says, I want you to put some clothes on, because apparently he didn't have none. He says, I want you to put some clothes on. So he dresses him, says he puts his clothes and his sandals and his tunic on. Why? Because let me tell you what the next awakening is. After your eyes are open to salvation, after your faith is awakened and you begin to move in God, the third thing that happens is, is you are awakened to who you are. And had it not been for him being awakened to who he was, he never would have been able to walk by the guards. But listen, this joker walked right by the guards, walked right by them, the ones that were going to execute him. He walked right by them. Why? Because he knew who he was. After that, the chains fall off. The next stage is what? Deliverance. You knowing you don't have to walk in bondage. You got to wake up to this. This is a stage. You got to wake up. And then the next stage is what? Come follow me. And he began to follow him. And everywhere that he stepped his feet, gates would open. Doors would open. Things that he couldn't get through on his own, they began to open. Why? Because he got to the stage where he says, now my faith is active. Now I know who I am. Now I'm free. Now I'm ready to move into everything that you have for me. And if you will do that, then you will find yourself going through gates that otherwise would never have been open. Luke is a man that is a doctor. Luke wrote with great detail. What did he say? He said it was an iron gate. Saying, in other words, you ain't getting this joker open. But all he had to do was begin to wake up and walk in those stages. And the last part was this. He said this in Acts chapter 12, verse 11. Then Peter came to himself. That's the last one. He came to himself. Now he's fully awake, fully aware. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent this angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Do you know what his last awakening was? He began to speak to himself. Peter never said one word until this moment. The whole time. He never spoke. 
But all of a sudden, he was fully awake now. And you know what he began to do? He began to speak over himself. He said, I don't need an angel to speak over me now. I don't need my preacher to speak over me now. I don't need the church to speak over me now. I am fully awake now. I am fully aware. And I can speak right over myself. Amen. Thank you. You can lay back down if you want to. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, wake up. Wake up, 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 wake up. Let's stand on our feet this morning.